Welcome, everybody, to Illusions of Free Will. And I'm John, and I'm joined with Kurt and Nomi and George. And today we're going to talk about models of the self. And I'd like to start off with a, um, a speech from a great play, American play, Fort Wilder's play, Our Town. Most of us read it in high school. And Emily, in the play, has died in childbirth, and she has a chance to review a day in her life. She chooses her 16th birthday, and after reliving the day, she then says goodbye to the world. And this is her speech. Goodbye world, goodbye world, goodbye Grosner's Corners, Mama and Papa, goodbye to clocks ticking at Mama's sunflowers, and food, and coffee, and new iron dresses, and hot baths, and sleeping and waking up. Oh, Earth, you are too wonderful for anyone to realize you. She looks to the stage manager and asks abruptly through her tears, do any human beings ever realize life while they live it every, every minute? The stage manager, no, the saints and poets maybe, they do some. Emily, I'm ready to go. <laughs> and I think that great speech, um, I heard a director say he had traveled with this particular production around the world in Moscow and in Tokyo, and even with headphones on, being translated to another language, the audience always wept. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, what is it that's so universal about uh, Emily's speech? I think she's saying goodbye to the world that we all know, and it's the world of the body, the ordinary stuff of daily life that she describes. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about a personal experience that I had, uh, because we've been talking about how uh, these shifts in consciousness or these shifts in experience um, that occur as we move from a conventional uh, sense of self to a post-conventional sense of self. And so I'm offering this as a personal experience, because I think um, first-person accounts are very important here. And I had a conventional view of the self until I had this experience, and I'm still working it out. So I'm just going to share it with you. This comes from an article I wrote, Alternate Ways of Knowing, which you could find online if you have an interest. Fifteen years ago, in a park in Lower Manhattan, I was lying on my stomach in the grass with my shirt off, reading a book called Belonging to the Universe. The book discussed the life of St. Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of the ecology movement. He was famous for his astonishing ability to communicate with animals, even making friends with a she-wolf. Captivated by his story, I had a yearning to be able to communicate with the animals as he had done. Enjoying the lazy afternoon, hearing the shouts of the children splashing in the pool, observing the play of the light on the leaves of the trees, I asked myself, what would it be like to be able to talk to the animals? And lo and behold, as soon as I asked the question, a bird landed a few feet from me. It was a small black bird with gold flecks on its wings, a very common bird. I think it's a grackle, actually. I'd seen it many times before, but I knew on this occasion I was in the presence of something uncanny. As the bird looked at me, I felt a thrill of recognition. The bird seemed as curious about me as I was about him. The bird perched on my butt and then slowly hopped up my bare back. Hmm. I felt its little claws. <laughs> touch each vertebra on my spine, and I felt a wave of energy going up and down my spine. Mm. And then the little fellow perched on my shoulder. I held my breath. He was an inch away from my face. We were eye to eye. And then the most amazing thing happened. He perched on my head and began to sing. Mm. It, it was a glorious, huge sound for such a little tiny creature, and it went up and down my body. Mm. And then he pooped on my head and flew away. <laughs> <laughs> the crown and glory. Yeah, now I was quite overjoyed by this experience, but I was also very perplexed by it because it was an anomaly. Mm -hmm. It didn't fit into mm -hmm. any of my conventional ideas of I have a self in here and you have mm -hmm. a self out there, mm -hmm. and we communicate through language. Because here mm -hmm. I was with this uh, a bird, wasn't mm -hmm. even a, a member of my species. Mm -hmm. and there was an interior experience that we both shared, and I have no idea how this is possible. So. I'm just talking about my current understanding, which may mm -hmm. change as we talk mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. how this all fits in with free will and our, mm -hmm. our topic. Mm -hmm. um, my current understanding is that um, the bird and the man share a per perceptual array, as we are both uh, motile creatures, we both move, um, and that we both have uh, obey the laws of gravity, but there's a horizon out there that we move towards and then it recedes mm -hmm. to behind us. So I share that with the bird. 
But more importantly, I, I started to understand the bird and the man are as if constructions mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that is transcendent and included by something quite ineffable. Mm -hmm. So um, I just wanted to add that first person account because I think that the self mm -hmm. is a, a combination of a first person perspective, a viewpoint. Uh, also, we can share a viewpoint. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we have third person's uh, objective, mm -hmm. scientific uh, observations, which is another kind of viewpoint. I would say the objective is a special case of the subject. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. There, every observation is made by an observer. Absolutely. So yeah. it's the interplay, I think, of these uh, different perspectives, these different views yeah. uh, that makes for our complex uh, world that we're mm -hmm. in right now. Mm -hmm. And another thing I would just want to add, and maybe y'all can jump in and help clarify this for mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. is um, the, I, I think of the self mm -hmm. as a, a, a network of relationships, metaphors, stories uh, that are competing with each other, sometimes blending and creating new and novel kinds of stories. But that personal pronoun I mm -hmm. is that point of view which emerges out of our visual uh, spatial intelligence, which Nomi knows a lot about Martin Gardner's theories. So uh, I don't think we can ever give up that felt sense, that uh, that first person, because this is where that, that's where all the action really is. Yeah. No, I, I wonder I, if you could yeah. comment on that. Yeah, no, I, I think you just nailed it in the sense that that would that is a classic experience of cosmic self in any of the great Eastern traditions. You could go to the libraries and find that people had that experience with a flower, with a bird, with a rock, with a... When they went into that interconnected space, and I think you've described, you know, every part of that that's classic awakening to this continuum of who we all are. I think there's only one aspect that is also involved, and that is that all creatures participate and experience what we call the subtle realm. And the subtle realms in those energy fields are where this sense of recognition and this sense of partnership with this creature, what you said, not even of my own species. Because the great leveler is this participation in these subtle realms. And the classic understandings today of shamanism and shamanic medicine Actually, when you when they interview shaman who know which plants in the jungle do certain things, the shaman says the plants tell me. Mm. So that again alludes to some type of communication in the subtle realm, which becomes real to both partners when that layer is penetrated. Okay, guys, I got to ask you how how are we tying in this? Like, how does this relate to the to the question of human will? Like, for example, with the shaman, shamanic experience or the experience of our interrelation relation with even non-human beings. I mean, by my understanding, it would seem that, like, regardless of how we're perceiving it, the sh shamanic, the integrated uh, th w with other organisms, that um, the bird was causal, your reactions were causal, mm -hmm. the, the shamanic um, experience is causal. So regardless of how we see the self, you know, from what perspective, mm -hmm. it seems that it's all a movie. It's all a play. Mm -hmm. It's all. It's all. You know, predetermined. What. What I'm saying right now. What. Whoever is about to speak next will say. It. And. And that's. Well, let me ask you. How do you know it's predetermined? Well, this now, when we examine reality, we have to take our best guess. So. So, so it's a guess. Well, but it's the best guess. In other words, like, all it's of. It's your best John, guess. No, guess no, no. It's mind. it's science's best guess. Oh. John, let me let me finish. Um, okay, the idea, the idea is that um, there is every scientific experiment, every empirical evidence is based on the process of causality, cause and effect. That's how science works. There, there based on the narrative that you've already created, though, about what's what. And what I want to point out, there's an amazing book that I think you'd enjoy. It was published by I Ions. It's by Willis Harmon, and it's called Global Mind Change. And then that that asks the question, what is the globe changing its mind about? And right. what he basically says is this. It addresses exactly what you said. But are you challenged? Are you challenged? I am, because he does. He says okay. we've gone through three progressive metaphysics. The first one is the one that you're describing, where we actually thought because everything is fixed, 
in individual beings that are doing certain things, that predetermines a certain landscape, which let's say is the conventional scientific materialistic reductionist landscape. Now he said as a scientist, he sees then that we've evolved now into realizing from string theory, from quantum theory, that we're in a continuum from the absolute largest to the absolute smallest. And that box isn't big enough to contain what's right, going on. So he says, wait, he says we're entering now into discussion that's dialectic. We're talking about formlessness and form, nature and nurture, right, Kurt, Kurt, brain that, and I mind. Hear, but that doesn't help. No, no beca it does. Because what he's saying is that it's the paradigms that are actually deciding why you decided this was the best guess. He's saying that's the best guess of Metaphysic 1. But what I'm saying... But let, me, let me just finish. Metaphysic 2 is, is a dialectic all right, Kurt, let me, where all we're right. exploring. All but right. he's saying where we're going is Metaphysic 3, which is a, a skilled language about a continuum. All right, Kurt, and a continuum, uh, everything's according, at play. According to, according to quantum physics, quantum mechanics, the only alternative to causality, to cause and effect, is randomness or indeterminism. Now, neither randomness nor, or inde indeterminism can give us a free will, because if our thoughts are coming to us random, if what we're doing is random, then certainly it's not freely willed, it's just coming out of who knows where, and, and the, the whole concept of random is actually is, is, is somewhat um, problematic. But what I'm saying is the models you're presenting, um, they, may be, they may be real, they may not be but they don't help in, in, in um, challenging the, the notion that free will is an illusion. Well, no, they absolutely help because what the scientific test of all this is what veracity, right? What works best, what's most skillful. If you go through all of what science is, the last, the last trait is veracity. So what, actually what Willis Harmon is saying, we're entering a period now and we're evolving. So we're, we're gaining this skill little by little. We're co-discovering it, co-discovering a new language, co-discovering a new way of perceiving which doesn't box us in. See, when I hear you say what you said, I hear fixed notions to begin with, something that you were either taught, something that you read, or something, because I myself came out of academic background, something that I was told was the box. All right, you but know? let's say you come And that only gives me two alternatives, right, which you Kurt, said, let's say free you come, will or determinism. Let's say you come to a different conclusion through contemplation, through a different kind of tradition, right? There is a causal order to that. There is a reasoning behind that. In other words, you know, a, a, a certain kind of idea comes to you that may be different from the conventional scientific, but there is a reason for that. And then there is there, a reason oh, for definitely. that. So the right. causality cannot be escaped. Right. The causality can't be escaped. But, you're, but what we're really asking is about how can we have the, the most dynamic system possible with multiple points of volition and also not even in a particulate sense, one that's really seamless in the sense of things. And how can we actually really understand all those points of volition and how they're, how they're interplaying? I don't think we're there yet, but I think what Willis Harmon is saying is where we're going as in, in, in actually the evolution of our cognition is to this place where we have a grasp of a different kind of system which, which would put some science on what you're saying. Again, you know, but my point you know? is that like, if you use that perspective, you know, where is the explanation that, that how, how that would give a free will? You know, how... how Why do you want free will? It would dissolve. Actually. No, no, the, I don't <coughs> want free will. The, the, the point of the show is to show um, people that free will is an illusion. That it's, you know, it's something that, that um, was created by people like St. Augustine and, and um, Peter um, in, in Romans to kind of justify that God, you know, cannot have, like, created evil, so it must be our fault. You know, free will is a Christian concept, at least in the West. So basically, you know, if, if we're going to, like, um, bring in different perspectives, whether scientific or from different traditions, um, it seems that regardless of the perspective, if we understand its nature logically, then there's reasons for those perspectives, and that's what precludes the free will. That, so, like, regardless of what, you know, even if something is, is there or not there, if, if we have this, this view of a things, you know, this, this dichotomy of experience, neither, you know, neither the conventional nor the, the other dichotomy would allow for free will. Yeah, and I guess the thing that I'm asking is, you know, why, why do we have to have either one or the other? I'll tell, well, why can't we have a dynamic system in which there's a dialogical understanding 
instead of a monological understanding of, of what, what we're actually looking at. And this is the new language we're trying to exactly. create. Uh, we're uh, hopefully creating a new vocabulary, yeah. even as we speak. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, it's a, what, I, I, in philosophy of science now, that's the way they differentiate it, that the older methods were monological in the sense they set conditions, and then they use systems of logic based on those parameters. Dialogical systems are asking new questions. They're saying in a dynamic system with multiple points of volition. So in other words, I would say, look, um, instead of saying there's no free will, it might be more accurate to say there's conditioning. So certainly there, there's relative free will, but there are all kinds of conditionings on free will, cultural, advertising, symbol systems, you know, whatever it would be. But if I wanted to, I could kill you right now. If I had a knife, I could actually kill you right now. So I would have the free will to actually do that. Well, you, you could kill me, but you wouldn't have the free will to kill me because there would be reasons for that that would go back in time in a causal pattern to the past yeah. before you were born. Yeah, and so, and, but are both of those things true at the same time? No. Ah, Is this table here and not here at the same time? Are both of those things true at the same time? What do you think, John? Neither <laughs> nor. Neither <laughs> nor. Hey, gentlemen, is this, here, is this table here? Well, what is this table in the sense if you go down to the level of seeing molecules or energy patterns, this table is no longer distinguishable from right. the carpet but from the, you when know. When we have a discussion, we have a shared understanding That's of terms. That's what we're saying. That's shared, what we're saying. Shared Those are boxes. Right. Let uh, me, can I add yes. something to it? You're yes. calling it boxes, but that's a kind of container. I just wanted to talk yeah. about the image schema of the container in cognitive linguistics. They talk about how psychological states uh, it's hard to think of a, a, of a state of consciousness without a container. So when we have a container, we have an inside, we have an outside, we have an edge, mm. we have deep in the container. So we talk about this in our ordinary conversations about being in a depression, being out of depression, mm. being mm. deep mm. in depression, mm. being mm. in love, being out of love, being at the edge of love. So I think it's very important for us to realize that this is a very strong tendency of ours is to project this experience of right. the container onto our conceptual categories. Absolutely. And this may, I think, come from our experience of being in a womb. We were inside mama and mm. then we mm. exited mm. the womb. Mm. And this is a deep uh, trauma for many of us. And I think we have a tendency mm. to um, deal with this uh, fixation actually on the container. But there are, yeah. I think this uh, pure consciousness event that we're yeah. trying to describe can't be contained at all. Uh, no, I, I agree. I, I think I, li I like your metaphor because not only the womb, but you know, anything that's a perceiver is immediately entering a subject object right. Split. world. Absolutely. Actually, yeah. And so then the question is do we have to be in that sense slaves to the artifacts? that that subject object world creates and basically the people that are looking at the deepest of subjective experience as you just talked about where they have this profound experience of not being separate anymore they come up and they say no we we don't need to be in that box we can live in both and worlds and that is the illusion that we're separate that's the illusion that we're separate and from that because it's really a pathology of the west flows a tremendous amount of the questions to begin with. So it's a lot of the questions, in a sense, aren't even valid questions because they come from a linear trap to begin with. And you could go round and round and round, and they can't be solved because the only option is this or this. Right. The only option would be choose. I mean, look at abortion. It's all going to be decided on the philosophical premise you start well, with. Even, and we can't escape that because, like, with the points you're bringing up, that there's a different way of understanding reality, you know, um, by saying that, you're, you're implicitly saying that the conventional reality is incomplete, wrong, you're making not a judgment. Wrong. Not wrong. Uh, it, it's, it could be seen as a tool, and a tool of some relative skillfulness, but we could make some judgment about how skillful. But what I'm saying is like, when, when you um, present a perspective like a self that's not personal but that's global, like a kind of an understanding that includes the beingness and the, and the not, the, the dichotomy. That is a position. You know, there's, you know that, that position can either be right mm -hmm. or wrong. Within a certain framework. Here, I'll give you a good example. This, I, 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 I like this one. 
the value of conventional science at the level of skillfulness is that when we, if we were going to go have an appendectomy, we definitely would want to go to a doctor who had performed that with testability, repeatability, and predictability, and he got 10 appendectomies of 10 correct and not just one out of 10, right? So that's the value of that particular dialogue with reality. But if you look at shamanic healing, which would be dismissed by the reductionist world as non-existent, the nature of shamanic healing, if you allow it to exist in its own frame, is that it, it will by nature be hit or miss. But its hits will be huge, and its misses will be huge. But they're in a different dynamic within, rea within reality and not to be dismissed. We should be a creature with both skills. You know, this is kind of where this new dialogue is going. Don't, don't dismiss either. The, the doctor who does the appendectomy has a skill. The shamanic healer has a skill. One is not repeatable by nature. Okay, but and we need to be is. comfortable with being uncomfortable with all of this. This is, we're in a paradox, an impasse, it may be a conflict, but these are very important. These are the pivots that get us to a more complex worldview and a more complex and richer experience of the self. Right, and what you're absolutely saying is that we end up doing that, just like what you talked about here, because we have an experience that we can't deny and therefore that doesn't we must, fit <laughs> exactly we must then factor it into right. our worldview now I was at a conference with Jane Goodall and a couple other well-known scientists where the question was asked how could modern reductionist science ever get on the bandwagon of conscious evolution and world change in, in that mold and basically what uh, she said and what J.J. Hurtock said and what Wayne Teasdale said is that it could only happen by individual scientists having experiences and usually more than one because one would be anecdotal and they would forget it. They'd have to have several that were so real to them in this other dimension of these other realms, the subtle realms, whatever you want to call it, that they would have to factor that into their larger view of reality. Now, some people have done that. I'll just say a good example is Robert Wright who wrote The Human Animal and then his recent book on the evolution of God. All of his development and his track has been from the combination of his hard science and his Zen meditation. All right, let's 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 bring this, because we have to like, basically what we're, what we're trying to do is improve reality, improve the world. That's that's what discussion is about. Absolutely. I'm not. So. <laughs> I think the world is already perfect, so and that's not my aim. So the idea <laughs> is... Um, we have a, we have shared ideas, democracy, um, right and wrong, morality. So let's say, I mean, because you, you're you're trying you're introducing a, a kind of a mindset where it's a sliding scale mm, mindset. Yeah, where no yes, but but in our conventional reality, does that work? Uh, let's, let's, well, let's say it's not the majority view right now. No, no, and I'm talking about like interpersonally, uh, let's, let's say in your life, oh, in my life, in our life. it could work wonderfully work. in a personal life. So like, yeah. so, but what I'm saying, what I'm asking, like for example, this illusion of free will mm -hmm. causes blame, causes guilt, causes harm, causes us to compete rather than cooperate. Yeah. So like from, your, from a perspective of this kind of like um, mindset that's unconventional, mm -hmm. that's accepting of all, yeah. things yeah. like murder, lying, theft, all this could be, well, acceptable as a different mm, reality. No, no, because that, that's again, a, that, that's a misunderstanding because, see, as, as the Dalai Lama would tell you, if you enter into the world that John's talking about with his experience here, what comes with that is a sensitivity toward the world, toward that bird, toward himself, mm -hmm that would decide from the get-go that you're not going to misuse people, you're and, not going to... And yeah, I want to so add so something to this, because we're, we're almost running out of time. I believe that uh, science and, and the humanities can learn a great deal from each other. I think the poets get there first. I think uh, we had Picasso before we had Einstein. Um, theory of Wait relativity. Wait a minute, now, hold on a second. What? And we're, I want to turn to Nomi because he has a poet that I would like to <laughs> share with you. Okay, if Rumi had something to say to John, he would say this. It's as when a bird perches on your head <laughs> and your soul trembles for fear of its flitting. So you don't dare to stir, lest that beautiful bird take to the air. You dare not breathe. You suppress a cup, lest that presence should slip away. And should anyone speak sweet or sour words to you, 
you lay a finger to your lips, meaning hush. Bewilderment is that word. It makes you silent. It puts the lid on the kettle and fills you with the boiling of love. Thank you. Okay, uh, um, Picasso, okay, he, he was an artist. He was a graphic artist. You know, he presented ideas, you know, but, but Einstein, you know, created relativity. No, I'm just talking about cubism or, is a visualization of the theory of relativity. And he came, he did his major work 10 years before the theory of how, relativity wait came a minute. out. How do you I get believe from, there's a relationship. But it was still causal. How do you get from, how do you get from um, Cuban, um, cubism, my understanding, because I was an art major, is like cubism is like just re reducing the, the, the body and objects to certain kinds of, of elementary shapes, cubes, um, rectangles, squares, and all. Einstein um, basically um, discovered uh, certain laws of, of, of the universe, physical laws. But it's worth asking how he discovered them. And of course, his method was daydreaming. And when you read his autobiography, he said the, in the patent office, he could daydream and he would set up impossible situations, daydream his way through them, and then he would discover new sets of rules. Like being at the edge of the right, speed but, of but light Picasso, with a mirror in his right, hand. Right, but Picasso didn't invent that. We all do that. In other words, like, there's, there's a, I think it was like Newton or somebody, they would like um, try to fall asleep with, with two balls on mm -hmm. uh, either hand. Sure. When they went, when at the moment they slept, that's the moment of inspiration. This is some, this is something that yeah. that's it's human. It's yeah, that, and that's human. The, and that's and the subtle. That's what we're talking about. Absolutely. Then that's the uh, subtle. And realm. that's where uh, I think uh, we're going to have to leave it for today. Um, <laughs> thank you all very much for your contributions and uh, for tolerating the ambiguity of this mm -hmm. uh, great mm -hmm. awakening. I believe we're all <laughs> participating in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.